All right, let's talk a little bit about Legend of Madrid. There's a lot going on here. This piece is fantastic. It's so much fun and my students just love it. They love to show off in the cadenza. It, that's a really special feature of this. So we're gonna start at the beginning with the basics. Two things we need to identify are the key signature and the time signature. So first off, the time signature. This piece is in 6-8, which means that an eighth note gets one beat. So you'll be counting one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, at least at the beginning until you get up to a performance tempo. And the key of the piece is D minor. So one way to check uh, the key of the piece, of course, is to look at the key signature for sharps and flats. And if you look at the key signature over at the beginning, you see uh, of each row, you see that there's one flat marked. If there's one flat, it's always going to be B flat. <clears throat> and B flat tells us that we're either going, going to be in F major or D minor. Um, so starting off here, we have a D in the right hand and then the notes in a D minor chord in the left hand, D, F, and A. So it's pretty clear from the start that we are in D minor. You can also check the last note of the song because most of the time a piece will end on a tonic note or the tonic chord. Interesting thing happening here, the low note in the left hand at the end is a D. And there is a D chord in the right hand, but it's a D major chord. So that kind of um, throws us off a little bit if we're only looking at the end of the piece to f figure out the key signature. But a lot of times songs will be in a minor key and then at the very end or near the end, they'll shift to the major tonality of that same key. And that's what's happening here. And it kind of adds to that Spanish flair, that kind of flamenco sound that we have going on here as we are in Madrid in this piece. So the piece is technically in D minor, even though it ends with a D major chord. Now, tempo, the tempo marking is with motion in two, dotted quarter note equals 69 to 84 beats a minute. And I was playing around 80 for the dotted quarter note. So it's not a quarter note that equals that, and it's not a dotted half note, it's the dotted quarter. So it's one, two, three is, <coughs> And the equivalent of what you're doing here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Each one of those beats, the snaps I'm making, one, two, three, four, five, six, is the number of beats per minute. So you want this, one, two, three, four, five, six, to either be, well, to be between 69 and 84 when you're up to performance tempo. And that's for most of the piece. When you get to the cadenza part, at measure 18, the tempo is kind of thrown out the window for a little bit and you're gonna do things free form. You don't have to worry so much about counting or keeping a steady beat. In fact, you want to not keep a steady beat and uh, we will talk about that in just a moment. For the most uh, part, my students always start off counting this in six because they're going a little slower to learn it and then when they get up to tempo, they'll count one, two, It's just a lot easier to count that way. You don't have to say as many numbers out loud or in your head. So it's a little bit easier. Uh, now going on, a few things I wanna mention that are really important to this piece. Um, one is the pedal. You wanna use the pedal as written. Um, make sure that you're lifting up when the pedal says to lift up and letting those dotted quarter notes get their full value. For instance, in measures two, four, six, etc. cetera. Um, you want that dotted quarter note to last for the first half of the measure and then lift up on the pedal and give your left hand a rest in the last half of the measure. Um, dynamics are really important here to give this interesting interplay um, between, like I, I think we're kind of imagining maybe a bullfighter or some dancers or a guitar or something like that going on in the city of Madrid. And so we want some loud textures, some soft textures and some crescendos where you start soft and get gradually louder. And we want some diminuendos where you start loud and get gradually softer. And that just adds to the character of the piece a lot. So really pay attention to the dynamics throughout. Um, another thing that's kind of new here, if you're following the Faber Piano Adventure series, is the grace note. This is the first piece in Lesson Book 3B where the grace note is talked about. And this is a very small note with a little slash through it, a diagonal slash. Well, it can be more than one note. Sometimes it's two or three notes even. But there's a slash through the stem and the flag. 
in the grace note. And the grace note is played quickly right before the downbeat um, of the, the note it's in front of. So the first time we see this is in measure 17. And a good way to get comfortable playing this is just to practice the quick motion. And remember that this sharp sign carries through. A lot of people will get confused and think that they have to change from the grace note to the quarter notes like that, but you don't. That C sharp carries through, so just leave it the same. Ta-da! It's kind of like saying ta-da! Ta-da! So give it a little da da like that. And just practice up and down, up and down. You might even use different fingers just to give it a shot. And that's what you're going to end up with. And the grace note will happen before the quarter notes in the right hand, obviously, but also before the quarter notes in the left hand. The quarter notes in the left hand and the right hand on beat one should happen at the same time. So the grace note happens right before, like this. So it's grace, quarter, grace, quarter, right? And that's that kind of Spanish flamenco flair that we're getting right there. It sounds like da da strumming a guitar. It's a really cool sound. It's a great effect you can get with grace notes um, on the piano. And there are slightly different grace notes on the last page of the piece. So if you look at page, uh, measure 36, you have three grace notes stacked in a triad, and that's a D minor triad. And what they're telling you to do is play the chord quickly as a grace note before you play the chord as a dotted quarter. So you actually do that. You play the chord really quick and come back down for the dotted quarter. I'm sorry. Here's one in G major. So you really just get to like da -da, just let out all of your energy, ba -bom, like that. It's really fun. So that's how you do the grace notes. Now let's talk about the cadenza and the cadenza section of the piece because things really change here. This is at measure 17 at the top of page 28. Um, so two really important things. One is the time signature completely changed. We were in 6-8. Now we're in 4-4, four, four. so this is going to give a very different feel and a different structure to this section. Although there's only two measures where you're really going to be counting. And that is because if you look at measure 18 and measure 20, there's way too many beats in that measure. You can see there's way more than four beats. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14 beats or something like that, technically, if you if you were going to count. So that doesn't fit into our definition of 4-4 four, four at all. But the section is marked cadenza. And if you ever see a section marked cadenza, you will know from this point on that that passage is not supposed to be played rhythmically in time and it will have extra notes in it because it is supposed to be like a little show-off section. Um, this is where we let our fingers just flow and act like they are, we're going to act in this instance, like they are coming up with the notes on their own and they're just magically landing on these notes that sound really good. Um, in some pieces, a cadenza wouldn't actually be notated and you would just sort of improvise. But for this particular piece, since we're still learning here, we're gonna follow the notes, but let the rhythm be really loose and fluid and let the dynamics be kind of exaggerated here. You can speed up and slow down where it makes sense to do that. Um, and they already have piano to mezzo forte and a crescendo and a diminuendo marked. I would definitely follow that. We are going to leave the pedal off for most of this because you're, most of these notes are moving by step and pedal on stepwise movement can get really muddy sounding. There are too many seconds. But you need to leave your left hand fingers down the whole time, even after you lift up on the pedal, because we need that uh, fifth, that A minor fifth to carry through as like a background tone while your right hand is doing this sort of improvising cadenza, you know, special show off area. So we start with our chords.
left my left hand down the whole time. If I didn't, it would sound like this. It's okay, but it's just the right hand, so it loses some of its fullness and it's um, kind of like its context. It needs that fifth underneath. This hand is not. This hand is like showing off, and this hand is like, come on, come back, be, be normal, right? And then measure 19. So this is one, triple it, three, four. Leave the left hand down. Oops. I always forget that B flat. Get really loud here. And retardando. There's a retardando there right before the forte. Oh, where am I? And then you just go for it. Then you're back in. So the cadenza will take some practice, especially if you're not that comfortable letting rhythm kind of fly out the window. Um, but, you know, some people really like it. Some people don't like it. It's too freeform. There's not enough structure. Just try it anyway and realize, you know, you, you don't have to do this perfectly, especially if this is the first time you're ever playing a cadenza. Just do the best you can and, you know, um, suffer through it if you must. But it's really good practice. And now you'll know what cadenza means when you see it in the future. And you'll know if you want to play a piece or not if it has a cadenza. You'll know if you like it or not. One other thing I want to mention is the term um, broaden that happens in the next to the last measure, measure 41. So we've just transitioned into D major. Things are getting really big and climactic sounding right here. So from measure 39, we're playing this D major chord in the right and a D major arpeggio, octave arpeggio on the left. And then just move up an octave for the right. broaden above that measure. What does that mean? Well, it means, once again, you're, you're going to kind of stretch the, the um, sense of rhythm here. You're going to maybe slow down your count and just don't worry so much about being really rhythmic. For one thing, you've got a lot of fermatas or fermati here at the end. There's four. And so obviously we're not too concerned about keeping a strict rhythm right here. But the broaden is telling you, you know what, go for broke, make this sound extremely big and dramatic at the end. That's really what broaden is saying, is just like be dramatic, stretch it out, make everyone watch you playing this piece and just wonder when you're gonna hit the final chord, that kind of thing. So here, I'm gonna wait a little bit a little too long to do the final pieces here, the, the eighth note chord and then the final chord. I'm just going to really stretch it out and be a major drama queen at the end. And that's a good way to do the whole broaden thing. Just broaden it out, make it big, make it dramatic. It's also marked double forte or fortissimo, double F. So um, that, you know, why not just go for broke here at the end and have fun with it. This is a really great piece. I hope you give it a try. Um, don't be too intimidated by it because once you get the hang of it, it's really fun. My students like to memorize this one because it's so showy. They love to play it for their family. Um, it's just a really fun piece. It makes a great recital choice. Have fun and thanks for watching. <laughs>